Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Your Mark on the World show. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe, and we're producing the show today for Forbes, where I'm a contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing. Our guest today is Alan Monroe, who's the interim executive director of Shelterbox USA, where they are deploying tents uh, and other emergency shelter to people in Nepal and around the world. Alan, welcome to the show. This is a great topic and very timely. Devin, thanks so much. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Tell us a little bit about, uh, help us understand what Shelterbox is, where that name comes from. Sure. Well, it all started with a simple concept of what would you need for your family after a disaster and then built upon it from there. So Shelterbox is exactly what it sounds like. It's everything a family may need with regards to shelter in a big green box. So we've got water purification, pots and pans, mosquito nets, protection from disease, and um, you know even something for the children as well as tools to rebuild. But probably the hallmark of what we provide is our Shelterbox standard disaster relief tent. Uh, that is custom designed for our organization. We also provide other types of assistance as well. Uh, what's important is that we curtail that, that assistance to exactly what's needed on the ground uh, for whatever the beneficiaries you know, need in that particular environment. Uh, we've been around for about 15 years. We've been deployed to, let's see, about 250 disasters in 90 countries, helped out more than 150,000 families. Right now we're deployed in probably eight countries uh, in addition to in the situation in Nepal right now. Wow. Well, let's talk about uh, Nepal. Uh, what do you know? What do you hear from your people on the ground? Who do you have there? What's the organization look like? Just give us some sense. Holy cow. This is such a, uh, a tragic, tragic situation. Well, the situation really is. And, you know, we've had a, a team on the ground since, uh, I want to say, about 36 hours after the tragedy. Uh, right now, we have four teams uh, on the ground who are working as quickly as possible to overcome some of the logistical challenges that we're facing. Uh, you know, Nepal is a landlocked country. Um, it is a situation where the, the airport was actually damaged here in the past couple of days due to aftershocks, in addition to the damage that it, it uh, experienced due to the, uh, the, the primary earthquake itself. So getting aid in you know, is, is definitely a challenge, though our, our latest shipment just recently arrived. Some of the first, uh, we actually had pre-position aid that was already located in Nepal as we were responding to flooding there just late last year. And that initial shipment of aid actually went to field hospitals where they were overcrowded uh, with the need, uh, the sick and the wounded uh, looking for refuge, didn't have any place to go in the hospital. So the hospitals set them up as recovery rooms and also triage centers. Uh, we also uh, were working pretty closely with the international um, aid uh, sector, what's called the shelter cluster, a lot of organizations that are focused around shelter, uh, to ensure that we have a coordinated response, that we're not going to duplicate anybody else's efforts, but also we're going to try to help uh, as many families as we can. One of the things that we're trying to do right now is to focus some of our efforts outside of Kathmandu uh, in some of the most rural communities that have yet to be reached. We actually had a helicopter aid flight uh, and delivered some of the initial aid in, in that region about two days ago. And what was touching there is, was heartbreaking really, is that the families, we were the first aid organization that they had seen, and just the sense of relief uh, that our, our team on the ground um, kind of sensed uh, from the community uh, was heartwarming. Yeah, it's, it's uh, just tragic. I was in Nepal in March and uh, out in the rural uh, village uh, doing some volunteer work. And, uh, and as I've had reports come back, it, it is tragic to see that in some areas, 90% of the homes have been flattened. Uh, my, the estimate I've heard most recently from uh, our friends at Choice Humanitarian are that they, uh, there are 800,000 uh, dwellings have been uh, destroyed, leaving millions of people uh, uh, without homes. Uh, th there clearly is not a bigger need in Nepal right now for anything uh, beyond shelter. I mean, this is what you do is the solution to the biggest problem. Uh, how do we scale this up? Tell us, tell us a little bit about what it's going to take uh, to address the needs of literally millions of people who are now without shelter. And, you know, and monsoon's coming in a month. 
you know, that right there is what's keeping me up at night is that, you know, we have millions of people that are out under the elements right now. And, you know, the temperatures are moderate. You know, they're in the, the between the 60s to the 70s. But when, when, the, when you add rains to that without shelter, if you're sick, if you're wounded, if you're elderly, if you're child, you know, a child, uh, the elements can be very Alan, did we lose you? And I think the, you? the say again. I think we lost you there for a second, but uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, I'm glad you're back. So you were saying, go ahead. The you know the the need is is unbelievable. You know, I think the the latest numbers that I've seen are are something in the ballpark of you know fifty thousand tents are needed on the ground right now, and and you know with the logistical situation that we have, trying to get aid into and out of the country, it's something that a number of organizations are facing. You know, right now uh, we have initial commitments for 5,000 families, which we hope to you know, get additional aid flights on the ground over the next couple of days. Uh, but we know that number is going to rise as our teams continue to work with a shelter cluster, conduct assessments, and find additional communities uh, that are in need. You know, it, it is just a, a daunting task. So what is, this, what is your scale? What is your capacity? So you, you say there's a need for 50,000 tents. It sounds like that is a, a modest estimate of the need, but okay, let's accept that for a minute. How many can you deliver and how soon can you deliver them? So let's use the example of Haiti, the Haiti earthquake back a couple of years ago, roughly about a week into the disaster, you know, we had kind of arrived at the same place where we were going to help out about 5,000 families, but in a disaster, the situation on the ground changes literally by the minute. and. At the end of the, uh, our deployment to Haiti, we actually ended up delivering something in the ballpark of 35,000 tents, or one-third of all the tented shelter in the country. So we have the capacity to help uh, to, to reach pretty close to those numbers, but it all comes down to the support that we receive as a result of you know, disasters such as that's experienced in Nepal right now and other disasters that we respond to. Uh, so we're going to do everything that we can, but uh, we really depend upon you know, support of of donors and organizations to help us to, to meet this challenge. Let's let's talk about some of that collaboration that, that is required for this to work. Clearly, one of the constraints must be money. Where does your money come from? Well, donations are the lifeblood of, of all organizations such as ours, uh, especially charities. So, you know, essentially we, we are very fortunate to have a, a wide um, you know, array of uh, supporters, both individuals, uh, institutions such as Rotary International that play such a huge role uh, in our organization, and also uh, corporations uh, as well. We've we've seen the support of, of a number of corporations so far, including uh, Neiman Marcus and, and and some others as well. But the need is is so great that we need as much help as we can to address this problem. What are the organizations that you're working with most closely to? clear the logistical hurdles. Uh, you, you mentioned Rotary as a source of funds. Uh, they have people on the ground, local people. Do you work with the Rotary clubs there in, in Nepal to, to, for volunteers, for distributing tents? What, 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 what are the resources you're using in terms of uh, partners on the ground especially? Well, I can tell you this, you know, Rotary is such an important part of Shelterbox. We're official uh, partners with Rotary International. Uh, to assist as many families as we can in crises like these uh, around the world. But I'll tell you that uh, Rotary plays a huge part in the financial uh, part of the problem, you know, providing aid, uh, providing uh, dollars to help us to buy additional aid for more families. But on the ground, uh, you know, there's 33,000 Rotary clubs worldwide, and we're able to partner with them very quickly when disasters such as these strike. And we're working uh, with uh, Rotarians on the ground. They're helping out with customs, with, with logistics, with all sorts of uh, potential problems that uh, organizations like ours can face in the field, including uh, translation. So, you know, it's it's huge to be able to partner with organizations such as Rotary, but we're also partnering with organizations like Handicap Inter International, the International Federation of Red Cross. Uh, you know, collaboration and major responses like this is integral to the success of the effort. Um, you can't necessarily uh, operate in a silo and expect to be successful. Boy, I, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, such a, 
uh, you know, the scale of this disaster is hard for people to comprehend, even for me after having been there. But the, the airport in Kathmandu was uh, stretched uh, to or beyond capacity before the earthquake. You mentioned the damage to the earthquake or the damage to the airport as a result of the earthquake. I also understand there's been damage as a result of the large uh, U.S. airplanes landing on the runways. Uh, so they're, they're no longer allowed to land their big planes. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of constraints that we just find difficult to imagine. Uh, and so it's really, I think, uh, imperative, to, as you say, to uh, collaborate across the board. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you're doing that because that seems to me the only way to be successful. Well, uh, tell us a little bit, uh, if you would, uh, Alan, about the work you're doing in the rest of the world. So, un you know, unfortunately, uh, we're quite busy. Uh, Mother Nature continues to provide issues for countries all around. Uh, in addition to humanitarian conflicts, such as that in Syria, you know, that's probably one of the largest responses outside of Nepal that we're responding to right now. I mean, the, the situation there is, is also has numbers that are hard to fathom. There are 9 million people that are displaced as a result of the Syrian refugee crisis. And, you know, we hear stories of families that are trying to seek refuge in, in other countries. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to help out uh, in that situation. But flooding in places like Niger and Malawi um, and landslides uh, in Pakistan, you know, on average, I think, you know, we probably respond to a new disaster every two weeks at Shelterbox, uh, most of which, you know, are not major news that are major disasters that hit the news, so to speak. So if there, if the local capacity to respond to a disaster is such that it's been overwhelmed and emergency shelter is in need, you know, we're going to be there. Well, fantastic. I, I commend you for the good work you're doing. Alan, I, you are, uh, I am sure, a role model to many. The volunteers at Shelterbox, the employees at Shelterbox, uh, many others I'm sure look up to you as a role model. Who do you look up to as a role model and why? Well, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer because I, I look up to so many people. Uh, you know, I'm inspired by so many. But you know, I also have the pleasure of responding uh, to disasters like this one in the field and have been out uh, roughly 10 times uh, to deliver aid. And what inspires me are the beneficiaries, the people that we're there to serve. You know, it's so often you hear that, uh, you know, that, that folks that have lost everything are helpless, but that's, that's not the truth. You know, they all they, they band together and, and the sense of hope and, and will that comes from the community to rebuild is, is heartwarming. I'll give you an example, Devin. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was responding uh, to a disaster in Taiwan. Uh, a typhoon dumped two years worth of, land, of rainfall in just two days, and massive landslides occurred in the central part of the country. And we were there. We were working with this uh, this very small community. We actually had to, uh, you know, get there by way of four by four trucks uh, because we were one of the first aid organizations to get into that particular area as well. And in this one community, there was this one gentleman who was working tirelessly. He was the unofficial town leader. He wasn't elected, but uh, he ensured that all of our needs were met. He showed us land that we could clear and set up shelter box tents and, and actually you know, get permission to use that land for a considerable amount of time and, and made uh, arrangements for water and sanitation and, and, and that kind of thing, which is also important uh, you know, when you're setting up a, a tent community. But then I got the sense that he didn't have a, a home, that his home was destroyed. And he shared with me that his mother, uh, he and his mother watched as their home was washed away and he had to make the hard choice to send his mother to go live elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, I, I knew that, that uh, we had an extra shelter box and, you know, one more uh, wasn't, wasn't, uh, it was going to be used obviously uh, by this, this man, if I could uh, get him to do so. And, and I said, look, you're going to get a shelter box. And what he said to me, I'll never forget. And he said, I want to make sure that everybody else in this town gets a box before I do because they're so valuable. And, you know, it's people like that that I admire because they care about their community so deeply that they're willing to sacrifice. And, you know, I, I argued with him for several minutes and, uh, and finally I won and he asked to borrow my cell phone and then he cried and told his mother that she could come home. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's instances like that that really put everything in perspective of uh, just the important work that we do. Boy, I tell you, that, that sure does. So I suspect that's related to the reason you do this. Uh, 
you're a bright, capable guy. You could be doing anything. You could be making millions on Wall Street. Why do you do this? You know, it's, you know, every day I come into work and I, I look at, I don't know if, if this is going to break the bank, but I'm going to show you the, uh, the pictures that I look at. I, hopefully the internet hadn't broken on me, but uh, every day right across from my desk, I look at those pictures because those are pictures I took from deployment a couple of years ago. And it puts everything in perspective of why I'm sitting in this chair right now and the, the important work that you know both ourselves uh, do as an organization and organizations like ours. Uh, you know, it's not a job. It's not, it's not a career. This is a passion. And I think it's the same for everybody that's involved with Shelterbox, both who are uh, here employed at Shelterbox, who have the, you know, the great opportunity to work for the organization, but our donors and our, our supporters and, and our volunteers as well. It's, you know, we're all in this together. Um, you know, you watch, you watch when something like Nepal happens on the news and you have a choice. You can say, man, that's, that's tough. And, you know, that, that's really hard to watch or you can do something about it. And that's what I come to do every day at work. Oh, fantastic. One last question. Uh, everyone who's watching this is coming at it from a little different perspective. We have social entrepreneurs and impact investors, philanthropists, all kinds of people, but th they have one thing in common and that is a desire to do more good, a desire to have more impact. I call it the greatest common factor. What can you give us one tip that would help us all do more good, have more impact? You know, we have a saying at Shelterbox and it's, it's kind of an organizational saying. It's been around since the beginning and it's, it's really simple. It's this, it's uh, don't do nothing, do something. And that, and that's, you know, getting back to what I just talked about a minute ago, you know, when you see that devastation on the television, not everybody can go into the field and deliver aid. Uh, but, you know, we can all help the people of Nepal and other countries just like it by taking action. Um, and whether or not, you know, disaster relief is the thing that, that uh, you know gets you inspired and, and you know breaks out that passion, or if it's training guide dogs, or serving meals to the needy, or helping out the homeless in your community, whatever it is, just do something. And, and that's something that uh, that I've carried through you know, my life uh, here at Shelterbox, but even before, you know, I have a history of service, you know, with uh, being an Eagle Scout and what have you. And you know, giving back is something that's incredibly important, and uh, you know, we all have that obligation to do that. Oh, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, Alan. And I, I want to make sure that before you go, you tell us how people can engage with you, especially how they can donate, but give us some uh, tips on connecting. Sure. Well, like we talked about earlier, anybody that's interested in, in taking part and in, in partnering with Shelterbox to help families uh, like those that uh, are experiencing tragedy in Nepal or other countries, Go to our website at shelterboxusa.org. If folks want to communicate with me, with me directly, you can find my contact information right there, or also um, at my Twitter handle at Alan SBUSA. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Alan. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to be with us today, and we wish you every success in the good work you're doing. Thanks, Devin. Means a lot. Really appreciate the opportunity. All righty. Let's do some good. <laughs>